So we've talked about getting measurements in the field. So now we've come back, we've downloaded our data to our, onto our computers, and I'm going to show you the things you need to do with your data in terms of calculations, some very basic calculations. It's up to you how you're going to analyze your data, but there are some, self, some sort of calculations that as geologists and geoscientists, we need to understand them and we need to be able to do them. So as an example, I'm going to use to start with the composition of a single mineral. And I've taken um, a sample of that granite at Western Beacon that I used for my um, tutorial in the field. And I'm going to start with this particular mineral, the large crystals. Yeah, this rock was porphyritic, so some large crystals in a somewhat finer ground mass. And these mega crystals, as we call them, were uh, a type of alkali feldspar called orthoclase. Now, there are three ways that you'll find, sort of used intermittently in literature, in studies, in reports, of, in which you can represent the composition of that orthoclase. The first one is probably the one you're most familiar with, and that is representing the mineral composition in terms of a mineral formula. Yeah? Orthoclase, its end member composition is K. AlSi3O8. So one potassium, one aluminium, three silicons, eight oxygens. So that is the composition of the mineral in terms of its atoms, but it's in terms of numbers of atoms in a, in a unit uh, of this mineral. So three silicons, one aluminium, one potassium, eight oxygens. Now, another way of representing that same composition is in terms of the weight of those atoms. And our XRF, I've seen the data that's been collected in the field in, in, uh, with our XRF, it represents the compositions of the rocks that, we, um, that were taken in the field in terms of the atoms, but by weight. So the second representation of a composition of a mineral of a rock is the one that is actually being used by our XRF. Yeah, so atomic proportions, so we, we talk about the atoms individually, but by weight. So it's simply um, the number of the atoms in a unit multiplied by their weight, by their mass. The third representation is the one we mostly use in literatures and, and literature and reports. And it's the one where we represent the composition not by the weight of the individual atoms, not as silicon, but as oxides. And that's historic. That we, we, we geologists tend to do that. Chemists would never do that. But geologists do that. And it goes back to the olden days when people were assaying at mines. They uh, calcinated the rocks so they heated it in the oven. All the elements um, combined with oxygen. And then they separated them as oxides. And then they weighed the individual oxides. And we've, we've kept doing that as geologists. We still represent our mineral um, compositions um, and, our, and our rock composition often in terms of these oxide units um, and also by weight. So we no longer talk about silicon but SiO2 and we not, don't talk about aluminium but Al2O3. Now also note that in these two presentation, representations at the right um, the numbers normally add up to 100. Yeah, if we've analyzed all the elements that are there these numbers should add up to 100. So these are the three representations of this alkali feldspar that we can use intermittently. And you can see them in the literature. And so often if you have uh, your data in one form and you want to compare them to um, a, a report or a paper, and in that paper the, the representation is this one where they show them as oxides, you'll have to be able to calculate, go from the one to the next. Now, just a, a little heads up, this is a, a website that I use a lot. It is uh, Web Mineral. It's got all the data, including chemical data, on, on minerals. And you can see all three representation on this website. Yeah, so here is the mineral formula for orthoclase. We're looking at orthoclase here. We have the weight percentages of the individual atoms, so potassium, aluminium, silicon, and oxygen. 
these are the weight percentages and they add up to 100 here. But we also have this representation uh, in terms of their oxides. So K2O, so potassium oxide, Al2O3, aluminium oxide, SiO2, silicon oxide. That we also call silica. And they add, add up to 100. So how do we do this? How do we go back and forth between these representations? Before I show you how we do that, I'll show you um, a table from a paper. This is actually a paper about the compositions of the granites here in the southwest of the UK. Um, and they analyzed a lot of granites and they showed a lot of data in tables. And here you see that representation in oxide units. Yeah, so it's different than what came out of our XRF instrument. This is in oxygen SiO2, Al2O3, titanium oxide, iron oxide, manganese oxide, ma magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, sodium oxide, potassium oxide, and phosphorus oxide. Now, these, this group of elements, are the elements that we normally call the major elements. They're the major and some minor elements. So there's all the elements that normally, in average rocks, make up more than, say, 0.1 of a weight percent. And for those elements, we use that oxide representation most frequently. All the other elements, we call the trace elements, the elements that are only present in concentration in terms of parts per million or even parts per billion, but less than um, 0.1 weight percent typically in an average rock, we call them trace elements. And those we show not as their oxide units, but as their elemental um, weight percentages. In this case, actually as parts per millions rather than weight percentages. So we have a geologist convention where the major and the minor elements, and it's typically only this group of elements, silicon, aluminium, titanium, iron, manganese, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus that are shown in this oxide unit notation, and all the other elements are the trace element. But how do we go from one to the other? So again, I'll take the example of this, this orthoclase here. Now, we need a bit of information in order to be able to do these conversions, and that is we need to know the masses of the elements. Now, I usually just quickly go online for the elements that I need, find the, the, the atomic masses. Yeah, so this is, for instance, a website um, that seems to come up quite quickly when you Google it, and it seems to be quite reliable, um, and it has all the masses of the atoms. Yeah, so this is the unit here is an atomic unit, or also this is grams per mole. Yeah, so we have, for instance, the value for silicon here. One silicon atom weighs 28.085 28 atomic mass units. So first of all, for all the elements that we're interested in, for which we want to do these conversions, going from um, atoms by number to atoms by weight to maybe oxide units, we need these masses. So I've compiled the four elements here that are present in our um, orthoclase. So silicon, 28.085. We're going to need oxygen here, 15.999. And, and the other ones, uh, aluminium here, 26 and uh, 0.98 and a bit. So I've compiled them here for you. So those we need. Now, we also need to know which oxides they typically form. Yeah, and for that, uh, these sort of have to learn by heart or find, uh, find a table with data. So silicon usually forms silicon dioxide, SiO2. Titanium does so too. It's basically because the most common type of iron for silicon and titanium are 4, four plus. Yeah, the valence of a typical silicon is 4 plus. And titanium also 4 plus. And because oxygen is 2 minus, we get SiO2 and and titanium O2. Um, aluminium is 3 plus, so the unit, uh, the oxide unit is Al2O3. Iron can exist in either the sort of ferrous and the ferric form, so the 2 plus and the 3 plus form, and we basically just pick one. And you see some, some tables use FeO and others use Fe2O3. Just pick one, I'd say. Uh, manganese, magnesium, and calcium, they have one oxygen, so MNO, MGO, CAO. Um, 
sodium and potassium, they're monovalent, they're one plus, so they, uh, we need two of them to make an oxide unit, so it's Na2O and K2O. And phosphorus usually comes at the very end of the list, um, but it's a, it's a five, it's got a valence of five, so it makes it P2O5. Right, so here is the, the sort of scheme for calculation. So I started on the, in the top left here uh, for our orthoclase formula, remember KALSI3O8. So we have three silicons, one aluminium, one potassium, eight oxygens. Now, if we want to know the atoms by weight, but not in the oxide unit, so if we want to represent this orthoclase in the form in which it would come out of our instruments, we need to first go to atoms by weight and then normalize that to 100%. So atoms by weight, so there's three silicon atoms, I multiply that by the um, mass of a silicon atom and I get a relative mass proportion of silicon. I do the same for aluminium, I add one aluminium atom, I multiply that by the mass of, of an aluminium atom, I get this number, potassium the same, I add one potassium, multiply that by the mass of potassium, get this number, oxygen, I add eight oxygens, multiply that by the mass of oxygen, 15.9999, almost perfect 16, I get this one, I add them all up, and now I need to, if I want to represent that in, in weight percentages, I need to normalize that. So each of these numbers are now divided by the sum and multiplied by 100, and then I get percentages. And here I have that representation that I showed at the beginning, where I have the composition of an orthoclase, but in atom units, not oxide, atom units, silicon, aluminium, potassium, oxygen, um, but by their weight and normalized to 100%. So about 30% would be silicon, a little bit than 10% would be aluminium, 14% would be potassium, and 46%, so the bulk of it, is oxygen. Now, remember that in, in our XRF, if we had a perfect measurement and we analyzed a, an orthoclase, we would be able to analyze silicon, aluminium, and potassium, but not oxygen. So we would have a missing, uh, missing number there, that, that shown a balance on our screen, of about 46%. Okay, so this is atoms by weight normalized to 100%. However, if we want to know what this looks like in terms of oxide units, the way we normally find it in the literature and in reports, we need to do something else. We need to go from atoms by number, so on the top left again, so remember, three silicon, one aluminium, one potassium, eight oxygens. And we need to combine these now into their oxide units. So remember, silicon forms SiO2, aluminium forms Al2O3, potassium forms K2O. So if we have three silicons, we can make three of these SiO2 units. If I've got one aluminium, I can only make half of an Al2O3 unit. Same for potassium. I've got only one potassium here. I can make half of a K2O unit. Now I quickly check whether uh, I've done it correctly, whether I've got the required numbers of oxygen here. Um, so I've got three SiO2s, that makes six oxygens. I've got half an Al2O3, that makes one and a half oxygen. I've got half a K2O, that's a half oxygen. Add these up, so six plus one and a half plus a half makes eight. And that's correct, that's the number of oxygens I, I, I had in the formula. I haven't made a mistake with these oxide units. Okay, so I have now oxide units by number. Now I want to have oxide units by weight, so I have to multiply these numbers by the weight of an oxide unit. Now, we had the weight of the atoms. We didn't have the weight of the oxide unit yet, but we can easily calculate that because the weight of an oxide unit for silicon, and SiO2, is one silicon and two oxygens. So, 
085, that was the mass of a silicon, and two of these oxygens, and the oxygens were 15.999. Yeah, so that's the mass of a SiO2 unit. Multiply that by three, because I have three of those units in my orthoclase, I get a number. For aluminium oxide, Al2O3, I have half a unit. This here is the mass of an oxide unit for aluminium, so two aluminiums and three oxygens. I get this number. K2O, I had half a K2O unit here, and this is the mass of a K2O oxide unit. Add them up, get a number. Now it's actually the same number as here. Um, and normalize this to 100%. And now I get oxide units by weight. And if we look at that, then we see that silicon uh, dioxide, so SiO2, makes about 64.8% um, weight percentages. And here we see aluminium, a bit of 18, and potassium oxide, just under 17. And again, they add up to 100. So in this sort of scheme of things, there are two routes. If we started with a mineral formula, we can go this route and we get atoms by weight, or we go this route and we get oxide units by weight. But sometimes you have this data, oxide units by weight, and you have to go back. Um, I'll, I'll, show that, I'll show that later. But here we have, again, the three representations. We have atoms by number, atoms by weight normalized to 100%, and oxide units by weight normalized to 100%. This is that, um, the slide that I started with. These are these three representations, and I've shown you how to go from one to either this one or that one. Yeah. So from this one to either this one or that one. Now, I suggest you try and do this for yourself as well. Um, and so the second mineral that I've chosen um, for this calculation, it's a very similar calculation, is kaolinite. On my way back, I also picked up a bit of granite that was almost completely altered to what we call here China clay. Yeah, it's the stuff that's made, uh, used to make porcelain. It's the clay mineral. Um, and actually, most of this is kaolinite, Al2, Si2, O5, and it has four OH groups. As an exercise, I would try and, first of all, start with this kaolinite mineral formula and calculate what that would look like in atoms by weight, normalized to 100%. I've given you a bit of information here how to do it. But also follow the other route where you go to oxide units, then oxide units by weight, uh, and oxide units by weight normalized to 100%. That should give you the three representations of kaolinite. So I will show you the answer in the in about 10 seconds, but maybe you can pause the video and try and do this calculation for yourself. Because if you can do that, then you start to get how to go from one of these uh, ways of representing the, the mineral composition in terms of the other sort of representation. So if you've done this correctly, this is sort of the numbers you should be getting. Yeah, If you have it in atoms by weights, Silicon 21.76 weight percent, aluminium 20.90, oxygen 55.78, and hydrogen 1.56. If you have also calculated the oxide units by weight normalized to 100% correctly, you get this composition 46.55 for, for SiO2, uh, Al2O3 becomes 39.50, and H2O becomes 13.96 adding up to 100. And this is correct because I can go again to my web mineral website, look up the mineral data for kaolinite, and there I see its mineral formula, its compositions in terms of the atoms by weight and the oxides by weight. So all three representations are there and they correspond to what I had on the slide. Now, remember, this representation, atoms by weight, normalized to 100%, that's sort of the form in which we would see 
our XRF analysis. If we did done an XRF analysis of this kaolinite, this is what we would normally expect to see. Except for that our XRF doesn't measure oxygen and doesn't measure hydrogen. They're too light to be measured. The X-rays are not powerful enough to be detected by our instrument. So what we would measure instead is ideally we would see silicon 21.76 weight percent, aluminium 20.90 and about 57 percent missing. So the balance would be about 57 weight percent. That would be the case if we had an ideal analysis of a kaolinite. Now I got very excited because in the field uh, data um, repository from last year there was the students in the field measured a material, a standard material that was labeled kaolinite and then measured it many times on day one. I think it measured it every day. So there's a, there's a file there that says many measurements of a, a material called kaolinite. So ideally that mineral could be used as validation because you could compare what was measured there with uh, what we would expect for kaolinite. Um, now I've got one of these measurements here of that particular material. You can look it up yourself and you can compare now what we see here to what was measured. So if you wanted to do some validation on your data you could compare these but remember we don't know exactly what this material is even though it's labeled kaolinite um, it may not necessarily be kaolinite. Okay I now also want to quickly go to the compositions of the granites as an example that have been measured. So in, for instance, day six in the 2019 repository, there's a nice picture of this Wurmberg granite, which you would normally have visited. Um, but as I also explained, the, that granite composition is very similar to the granite I showed you in the video on XRF in the field. Uh, the video um, that was done here in uh, Dartmoor National Park in the UK. Um, but what you need to do there, and able to compare those analyses to some data that exists in the literature, is you need to take your field XRF analyses, which are atoms by weight, and I've taken the three analyses of fresh Wurmberg granite in the uh, data repository for silicon, titanium, aluminium, iron, manganese, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium and phosphorus. Those are again those elements that we normally treat as major elements. But in the literature there is some data about these granites but it's in oxide units. So you would have to recalculate these compositions in terms of oxide units. So what do you need to do? You need to go from um, these atom proportions by weight to atom proportions by number. That is the intermediate step. So you have to divide each of these by the atomic mass. So you need to, the data from the online data tables about the masses, and it shows the masses of uh, silicon, titanium, aluminium, etc. Then you get atomic proportions by number. Then from that you need to go to oxide units. Now remember, if you have one silicon, you can make one oxide unit from that. But if you have got one aluminium, you can only make half an um, aluminium oxide unit out of it. So that means um, you have to pay some attention there. Uh, so one aluminium makes only half an Al2-3 unit. And the same is true for potassium, sodium and phosphorus. But of course sodium wasn't measured because our instrument doesn't measure sodium. Then you've got your data represented as oxide unit by number and then to go to oxide units by mass, you simply have to multiply that by the masses of the oxides. Yeah, I've given them here, but this is simply one silicon at two oxygens, you get this mass. And then you could possibly compare that to the published compositions for this Wurmberg granite. 
Those are based on laboratory analysis, so we can assume that they are accurate. Um, and then you can probably say something about the accuracy of the data. Also from the repeat analysis, you can say something about the precision of the data. So you can do a full sort of um, quality assessment there, um, data quality assessment on, on, on those data, um, on those measurements, except for the fact that the material is of course not a certified reference material. We're simply publishing to, um, we're simply comparing here to some data published in the literature, which we're going to assume is more or less accurate. Um, to say something about the accuracy of our handheld XRF instrument. I hope that sort of was helpful. If there's any questions about it, don't hesitate to ask me, uh, either uh, in an email or via the online forum. And see you next time. Thank you very much.